welcome to Charmed Life, a radio show discussing spirituality, magic, and the unconditional love of the universe. Thanks for tuning in. And I am your host, Trisha Carr. I am so blessed to be here with you today. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to those of you who would be watching or listening, whether live or in the replay archive on iTunes or on YouTube. And it is really just such an honor to be here every single week, Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific, and of course, to be able to connect with you when it is in the archive, because, you know, time is an illusion. And so we are genuinely connecting our light at any time that we do endeavor to do so. I want to tell you one thing that Spirit impressed upon me as I was leaving my house to come to the studio. You know, we are here in Hollywood, California at the Sunset Gower Studio, Universal Broadcasting Network. Shout out to UBNRadio.com, where you can also watch the show. I just had this moment where I think that I just had a punch in through my crown or something and an affirmation, I guess you may you might want to call it. And so if you're listening, maybe this is for you. And it's just simply, I choose joy and I choose peace. And, you know, these words, they are very much like consciousnesses themselves, like an angel. You could channel in peace and you can channel in joy. And so in this moment, I choose peace and I choose joy. And how appropriate for the the December month when we have these seasons that are kind of having us to focus on joy and peace. And so I want to extend that to you because you are here with me. I am able to even more greatly experience peace and joy. And I do choose peace and I choose joy. I would like to say hello to the Lightworkers Lab, online spiritual community of which I am a teacher and a moderator. You can find it on Facebook as a Facebook group by searching the Lightworkers Lab. Welcome to the community, those of you who may be watching live in the Lightworkers Lab. It is such a treasured place to me, sacred space, intentional community, resources, and different ways that you can express your spirituality and to fellowship. And one other thing I want to mention is on my website, you will find trishacarcharm.com. You will find Healing Arts Academy. There's a calendar of the different events, classes, also the shows that are coming up, the different episodes of Charmed Life. And I have a class in which, which I'm teaching next weekend. It's Manifesting with Magic, and it's many different rituals, many different tools to put into your spiritual toolbox to experience a greater connection, alignment, and manifesting power. And with that, I'm so deeply honored to welcome my guest today. He is an internationally recognized stress management expert, corporate trainer, meditation teacher, and author of the Nautilus gold medal winning book, Sacred Powers, as well as the critically acclaimed and Amazon number one bestseller, De-Stressifying, The Real World Guide to Personal Empowerment, Lasting Fulfillment, and Peace of Mind, and also Secrets of Meditation, A Practical Guide to Inner Peace and Personal Transformation. And so with that, allow me to welcome the amazing David G. to Charmed Life. Hi, David G. So great to be here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so you grace me with your with your generosity of your time and your light. So thank you again for coming today. And I'm just really enjoying Sacred Powers, the five secrets to awakening transformation. And that is the topic that we are here to discuss today. But I would really love for you to share that story. If you don't mind, part of your journey as you share at the beginning of Sacred Powers, that moment, that, that catalytic moment for you, would you like to share that or any part of the journey that has brought you to this amazing place of being able to share and lead others? Sure. I think everyone has you know, some type of <clears throat> story of mm -hmm. uh, how they got on the path or mm -hmm. what happened. I think you know, pain can be an incredible motivator. Yeah. Um, for many of us and other times we have an aha moment and other times we just find ourselves at some kind of crossroads and uh, then boom the magic happens and, and we're there but uh, for me uh, uh, in the wake of 9-11 I was uh, I worked in, in the World Trade Center um, for a while on the 82nd floor of Tower 2 mm -hmm. and um, in the wake of 9-11 I was uh, walking uh, in Soho, southern Manhattan, uh, past a row of cardboard boxes that people were uh, living in. And as I walked past this particular box, uh, a hand reached out, grabbed my pant leg, and sort of like pulled me down. And I, in that moment, I, I just surrendered. And, you know, I, I worked in the world of finance for, for a lot of years, not used to surrendering, mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And in, in that moment, just like, boom, I just surrendered. And 
this uh, this 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 man who obviously in my in my assessment was uh channeling the uh the universe or god or mm-hmm. you know, clearly it's not just a person but this this divine um downloader uh peered into my eyes and he had these beautiful blue crystalline eyes and he said what's going to be on your tombstone mm-hmm. and that's a fairly reflective you know, moment uh, for any of us to be asked. And of, of course, you know, in the wake of 9-11 with all of my questioning and survivor's remorse and like you know, all these other aspects of my life, you know, here I was suddenly asking myself, what is going to be in my tombstone? What, why am I here? What is my purpose? And that really set into motion uh, a, a wild journey uh, that culminated with my own eat, pray, love kind of story uh, without the, uh, without the eating and the love, just a lot, <laughs> just a lot of prayer, um, and um, and then set me off on a journey where I ultimately bumped into um, met uh, Deepak Chopra uh, in Oxford, England, and then headed off to India for for six months and really in search of the guru. But it was in that moment, you know, where this this divine being, you know, asked me that question: "What's going to be on your tombstone?" And then I naturally, you know, like. I figured, oh, this is a person, you know, looking for for some charity right now. Let me reach into my pocket and and pull out a few bills and give them to this to this man. And he actually pinned my hand inside my inside my pocket. And you know, he reached up and, and said, "No, it's not about the money. Uh, the answer is is in the stars. Mm. Find your sacred powers." And you know, this happened a long time ago, and I've sort of like kept it in. And when I started writing Sacred Powers, it sort of like came into me as like a download. Let me share that. Let me share that aspect so people can truly realize the 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 the, the God that's in everyone. You know, truly uh, the the divine energetic force. And I know that you and I both believe so uh, so in that Einsteinian <laughs> quote that energy cannot be created nor destroyed yes. uh, it can only be changed from one form to another and we are just stardust right now we're stardust rippling stardust we're stardust speaking stardust you know reading stardust and uh, in that moment I suddenly everything became aware that was the that was the first of many many uh, interesting moments like that I call them uh, butterfly moments <laughs> where, like everything Everything stops. There are no sounds. The entire world goes away. And there were parts of this conversation where this man was not even moving his mouth. His mouth was closed. And he was, you know, having this conversation with me, embedding uh, these cosmic words into me without actually putting them through um, from his mouth into my ears. Uh, So, you know, that sent me out on a very, very uh, clear journey. And... You know, first it was a journey of trying to find answers, and then I realized, um, as I laid in a uh, in a hammock in a cashew forest in Kerala, southern India, reading the Bhagavad Gita, chapter two, verse forty-eight. You know, when I read Yoga Sta Kuru Karmani, that's when suddenly it all came clear to me. Yoga Sta, establish yourself in the present moment. Mm. Kuru Karmani, then perform action. Mm. And it was in that moment that I suddenly realized, oh, that's it. The answer rests inside. The answer to every single question we could ever ask ourselves rests inside. We just have to be willing to allow the fluctuations of our mind to slow. And then we can hear the whispers of our heart. We can hear the whispers of God, you know, the divine mother. Pick it, whatever your your, um, higher power is. And for me, that set me on a path that was so crystalline clear from that um, moment forward um, that if I found myself stuck, if I found myself on the cusp of a defining moment, and I believe we all are, that the secret, the answer to, to, to how we should walk through the world is to yoga stakuru karmani, just get still mm. and, th- and then perform action, then be brilliant. And I think, you know, that's, I've, I've, I've attempted to live by that, um, teaching people to meditate and practicing myself and really uh, being a student and a teacher of the present moment. Mm. So here we are. Here we are. (laughs) Just a few days ago, I was actually answering a question from someone who who emailed me 
I had I had a one of these episodes of Charmed Life where I was discussing archangels and you know a message from channeled from an arch, an archangel, and this person was asking me. Why, you know, I, I think that I can connect. I think I connect with Archangel Michael, but I, I basically, why can't I really hear or understand or connect with archangels? And so I was answering, and sort of, you know, a download of basically it, it, a mo- words came out onto the email that stunned me, and it was reminding me about that still when you're talking about the stillness within. But the words were that archangels or God or whatever higher we call higher power essence never speaks more loudly than the whispers inside your own heart, that stillness. And that all goes down, I guess, to the, if we believe in free will or not. So if we believe in free will, then we're always in charge. And that, I think the, the reason it feels like a, a will, a, a, so still, and it feels like a whisper is because of the context of the outside world <laughs> being so grand and, and complex, like the world of finance. So it's pretty amazing. You were in just about the most chaotic kind of experience when this breakthrough came into your life. Yeah. And, you know, that's a realm of serious uh, divine masculine. Mm. And Mm -hmm. really, for the last 17 years, I've spent um, so much time exploring the divine feminine, uh, Shakti energy, Mm -hmm. and uh, awakening Shakti and teaching people to to manifest um, through that through that process. And I think that, you know, really, we're, we're doing a divine dance between Shakti and Shiva and male and female energy. Uh, masculine and feminine energy but yes that was you know that's a that's about as as uh, serious um, and um, take no prisoners type of vibe that uh, even exists so I'm uh, I'm pretty happy that I've left that realm <laughs> and, and that I found uh, something that's really more of a uh, um, a more heartfelt calling for mm-hmm. me. More integrated. I, I think that the outer world or s- this, you know, society being so Shiva, so masculine, it, it's why it's so important, you know, the work that you, in teaching meditation, because we, we can't feel that stillness in that atmosphere, in that context. And we have to really, I think it's kind of beautiful. It all turns us back into ourselves. The universe is always pointing us back into our own power and we have to be quiet to be able to uh, experience her, <laughs> the, yeah. the Shakti. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. Um, because, you know, it's, uh, we, live in a, we live in a noisy uh, world, yes. at least sound-wise. And there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of things moving around. Uh, in Ayurveda, we could refer to that as like a Vata deranged world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, if we can slow ourselves, if we can give ourselves permission to listen, we don't listen enough, mostly, really. Mm-hmm. Um, if we uh, give ourselves permission to listen, there's so much that we can hear. We can be informed of, of so much wisdom and, and, uh, and beauty. Yes. We are uh, our own oracles. Yes. I, I, I love you. Know, you uh, we have to be still in order to hear it. And, and you said, Give yourself permission. That is so important because, you know, we we don't have time to do the things that, whether it's meditation or the different things that would allow us to connect with the wealth of our own soul and our own light. So we have to give ourselves to permission to experience the, the, you know, the time to do it. And that's, again, a very beautiful invitation to be able to, you know, giving yourself permission to connect with, you know, to find you because that's, that's who you've been looking for your whole life. <laughs> Right. And I think, you know, there's no, there's no meaningless coincidences. Mm. And the fact that you're, you know, Trisha Carr charm, you know, <laughs> so what is, what is charm? Charm is, charm is not chasing. Charm is um, attracting. Mm-hmm. Uh, charm is not like reaching out and, and, and screaming messages. It's truly, it's magnetism. It's, it's allowing, you know, the magnificence to come into you. And we don't spend enough time where we spend so much time trying to force our way and, and put it out there and communicate uh, with people, mm-hmm. realizing that listening is a very, very um, evolutionary way of communicating. I just had a dream. I have to tell you that, you know, how spirit works is really amazing because two nights ago I had a dream and it's one of those dreams that doesn't fade. 
And I actually, even though it was two nights ago, I told my husband about it this morning. And in the dream, there it was myself and my husband, and the myself character was sort of being very what I would judge as weak and and emotional and saying that I'm too weak to do this or that. And then my husband was running forward and being insensitive and barreling forward and leaving me behind. And of course, these both of these aspects are me. It has nothing to do with my, my relationship with my husband. It's because he's my partner. He represents that divine masculine in me. And so the message that I derived from that is that that divine masculine, literally told my husband about this morning, my divine masculine needs to slow down and become more present. And then my divine feminine needs to feel more empowered and then to coalesce together and find that that apex of integration and the, the, the uniting of those two powers. I think that's going on in all of us, is it not? Do you, do you agree, David G? Absolutely. And, and, and that's really why I feel that the, you know, that chapter two, verse 48 yes. um, of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, yoga sta. So that's establish yourself in the present moment. That's pure divine feminine. Yes. Kuru Karmani, then perform action. It's mm. pure divine masculine. But, so one without the other, um, you know, it's in, in sacred powers. I talk about um, the divine principle of awareness, which involves the sacred powers of attention, intention, Mm -hmm. and action. And attention, where you're really, really locked in, uh, without intention, but attention and action creates purposeless action. It becomes random. Mm -hmm. Uh, Intention and action without the attention uh, doesn't have the clarity, the crystallization of where we're coming from. And attention and intention without the action it's just wishful thinking. And so, you know, we, we really talk about that. We need that, that beautiful fusion of divine masculine and feminine. And we are probably dancing in it in every single moment as we're interpreting the world, as we're integrating the world, and as we're then flowing back out into the world. So that's amazing. Uh, yeah. You know, it just I just heard in that, too, is, you know, we are triune beings of spirit, mind and body. And the intention, attention and action is that trinity as well. Intention being more like the spirit, the attention being like thought or mind and the action being like the body. That's why they are interdependent and equally important. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's amazing. Wow, thank you so much for that. I'm going to I'm going to be using that. <laughs> I will I will attribute to you cuz that's a powerful teaching to meditate upon. And speaking of powerful teachings to meditate upon, the the five the the sacred powers, the five secrets to transformation and awakening. The first one you have listed is the divine principle of one. And in the book, you say there is only one, and yet there is an infinite amount of expression in our world, way beyond the nearly 8 billion people who populate the planet. Yes, way beyond, because we also have the the trees and the stars and the animals and, and the breeze even. Could you uh, talk to us about that pr- principle and how we can do we meditate upon it to awaken our own transformation? Yeah, I think our greatest um, our, our greatest power to to move through the through the world rests in our um, acknowledgement yes. that everything is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Sanskrit, the expression is "aham brahmasmi," I am the universe. This doesn't mean you're God. This means you're the universe, right? The universe. A lot of people who are who are uh, highly devotional say, "Well, wait a second. Are you saying you're God?" Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of people would say, "Well, metaphorically, we all are," but Aham Brahmasmi means I am the universe, which means I am the blade of grass. Mm. And, and there's a couple of trillion of those out there. Um, and, you know, I am the clouds. I am the sun. I am the sky. You know, if we are indeed coming from the same stardust source, then everything is oneness. And Trisha, I am you and you are me. Mm. And everyone who's watching and participating in this right now is also oneness with that and it's only when we start to separate and when we get into some type of non um when we deny that and and view things as as dual Mm -hmm. and whether it's body mind you know my body separate from my mind Mm -hmm. or you know as you said you know my soul is separate from my from my heart um you know, there's even the question, is my soul separate from divine spirit? And, you know, one of the ancient Mahavakyas, the master sayings, it's about 7,000 years old, is Ayam Atma Brahman, which means my soul and the universal spirit are one. Mm. And so when we realize that we're one, 
then we can get engaged virtually on any single level. If I'm one with you, why would I ever want to hurt your feelings? If I'm one with you, why would I ever need to be right? Mm. It's, we're one. It's my left hand and my right hand. They never argue with each other. They, they never do battle with each other. <laughs> Um, at their best, uh, they're empowered individually, and at their worst, they're working together to help lift something up or, or, or work as a team. So if we can see the world as this, and this is why our separations are so um, limited, constricted um, interpretations of who we are. So anytime we feel less than, it's because we're feeling separate from something. Mm. Yes. But if I know deep inside of me that the entire universe rests within me it's not me out there individually spinning separately from the world but the entire universe rests uh inside of me beautiful sanskrit expression from from some really ancient uh teachings um yatha pinde tat brahmandi as is the cosmic mind so is the personal mind mm -hmm. as is the cosmic body so is the personal body so essentially same same Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're not in the universe. The entire universe rests inside. And so when we realize, oh, the entire universe rests inside, that's infinity. Because <laughs> galaxies are tumbling into each other. And we know that spirit is infinite as well. So what can't you do? What's holding you back? So when we find ourselves you know, in sadness, in depression, in less than thinking, in who am I to, you know, suffering imposter syndrome in some aspect of our life. Mm. Uh, then if we suddenly realize, oh, I am actually one with the cosmos, with the galaxy, with, with, with the universe, with the divine mother, with Pickett, there's no separation between me and anything else. Suddenly we realize that uh, can't. And so the divine principle of one has existed in so many indigenous cultures, and whether those are ancient Indian cultures in the, in the subcontinent of, of India, or whether they are um, First Nation in Canada or Native American, you know, pick, pick the culture and go back in time to its civilization 10,000 years ago, and they were practicing that. Uh, and each of these cultures, of course, have then created gods to represent the stars, the wind, the rain, um, fire, um, thunder, you know, all things along those lines, because these were all expressions of ourself mm -hmm. as well. Yes. And so, yeah, the divine principle of one, I think, is like the starting point for, for so many um, ancient philosophies and wisdom traditions. And that's really why I, st I wanted to write sacred powers because I suddenly realized that, you know, we can talk about, well, there's a lot of religions and there's a lot of understandings, but when we truly go back and back and back and start to overlay them onto each other, there's a couple of core principles that run through everything, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, uh, 10,000 year old ancient uh, societies, Confucianism, Taoism. We suddenly start to realize, wow, there's a couple of solid core thinkings mm -hmm. and um you know we struggle with them here in uh in this modern world that we live in but we sort of have them running at the collective soul level through all of us and that's why um those of us who are willing to go on this path and it's you know the Venturing on the spiritual path is a very, very, uh, can be very horrifying because um, we're not really moving through change so much as moving through transformation. And with transformation, there's no going back. And that can be horrifying because we sometimes look back like, where was I? That was that I hated it, but it was, but it seemed um, stable. <laughs> you know, it seemed, my pain seemed certain. So I want to go back to that certainty. <laughs> Yet once once we take that step into the realm of energy and Reiki and you know communicating you know beyond these realms and truly touching aspects that are so far beyond us, that's where we you know for me one of the greatest comforts is knowing that there is no separation between my body my, my body my mind uh, my heart your heart divine spirit or, or anything or even that airplane that's going over here right now i could be saying oh I'm so irritated that plane's going over here. uh but instead it's like we're one with that plane as well absolutely 
So it's like, rock on, keep flying away from us. Um, <laughs> Definitely. We created the we created the airplane too. We all voted on it. <laughs> at least at least subtly speaking. Yes, as you mentioned, you know, these these principles and the divine principle of one is one way that I see it reflected in the many cultures and all of the major religions. All of the major religions have some form of the golden rule. Whereas, you know, in in the Bible, the Christian Bible, it is stated as do unto others as you'd have them do unto you or, or love thy neighbor as thyself. And that essentially those are saying that you love your neighbor as yourself because you are your neighbor. You are one. And the, the way that you love your neighbor is loving yourself. And when you love yourself, you're loving your neighbor. You know, there's it's a it's a loop. It's always bringing us back to that. And the divine principle of one, I also see neutralizes any reality, any illusion of judgment. And of course, right. Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged, because if, if you judge someone else, you are just judging yourself as because you are one, you know, rather than thinking of it, you'll be judged by some angry God, some outside force. You just are activating the frequency of judgment. And that is judgment upon yourself as well. It completely neutralizes it. How could there anything be judged if everything is one? which speaks to one of the sacred powers yes. uh, of the divine principle of one, the sacred power of your ripple. Yes. Uh, because the second you put that judgment out there and like, and it, it can be, you know, we're constantly judging. We're judging, oh, the light turned green. I'm driving in my car. It was red. It turned green. I'm, I'm making that judgment call right now. So judgment, you know, doesn't like, it's, it's not damning. But the moment you do judge, it creates a ripple. Yes. So good, good or bad or neutral judgment creates a ripple. So if it's like, oh, the light's green, what you've just, the ripple you've created is I'm going to start moving forward now. I want to put my foot on the gas and I'm going to proceed through this intersection. Well, it's the same thing. You point a finger at somebody and you go, oh my God, I can't believe you said that thing. Or I can't believe, you know, you're so this as if that person had a copyright on a particular human behavior <laughs> that's actually we all have. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the great teachings is that if we made a list of like the five things that we like really drive us crazy about someone, whether we despise them or we, you know, we pick it and we write that, write that list down. Oh, they're, they're cheap. Oh, they're too, um, they're too loud. Oh, they're, um, they're, uh, they're not considerate. Oh, they're, they're not compassionate. You know, we can go on, you know, pick, pick the list. It doesn't matter. Any, any one of us could write down at any moment, five things that bother us about a person or other people, uh, especially in the political arena that we're in right yes. now, you could pick it, you know, pick the politician you like least and write down the things that really drive you crazy about that politician. And these ancient spiritual teachings tell us that everything that you've written down is a human behavior. And if, it, if it bothers you, it's an aspect of yourself right. that you're actually denying. Exactly. And some people get so crazy with that because they've, they've created like that behavior only belongs to that person that they have a problem with. But the reality is in every single moment, the moment that we judge, we're just really holding up the mirror. Yes. And we're saying what aspect of me really bothers me, even if it's dormant or even if we're holding it down at some deep level. So the moment we judge... We're almost like acknowledging, yep, uh, what do they say? If you can name, um, well, it eludes me right now, <laughs> but essentially there is nothing we can point at that isn't resting inside. Right. So how do we, how do we get to that space? How do we, you know, how do we get to the place? And for me, I find that very comforting actually when I go like, oh my God, I can't believe that person said that. And then I'm like, I'm so angry at that person for saying it. I'm like, that really bothers me about that person that's saying it. That person always says that. You know, you like build up this whole dramatic case of whatever. And then ultimately in my heart, it's like, oh my God, I'm being so harsh on that person. Maybe I should forgive them. Well, maybe I should give my, forgive myself first. And then I go, I'll go through a, a whole other downside to that. And ultimately in the end, it's like, wow, I, I'd love to go up to that person and give them a hug because right. I was in my heart being so harsh and so mean to them. I want to, you know, make peace in that place. So judgment, yeah, is like the start of that. And the power of your ripple is not just you smiling at someone who made you coffee in Starbucks uh, or, uh, you know, 
making some expression to someone who cut you off in traffic or something <laughs> like that. You know, the power of your ripple is not just your words. It's, it's how you walk through the world. Mm. It's how's your footprint. Yes. Is that like a loud footprint? Is that a big footprint or is that a softer footprint? Is that a footprint of nonviolence? Mm. Um, you know, ahimsa. Is that, uh, is there a way that we can move through the, um, the world uh, more gently? Yes. And so I think these are all teachings because, you know, there's no finish line. We suddenly judge someone really harshly and then we realize, I don't want to be that harsh. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be that person who just judged that person so harshly. Um, but we have to acknowledge that we judged harshly to get to that other space. So I think there's a learning lesson in virtually every single interaction that we have um, with, with the world, whether there's people involved in it or not. Yes. Because we, because we are indeed one with everything. I love I love how you are talking about that the you know the divine principle of infinite flow is one of those sacred powers the your ripple and it, whether it's an actual action of words or deeds or if it is uh, in your feeling and thought space it still is energy and it still creates a ripple. You said in sacred powers, the energy of the universe is resting in your soul. And the most fundamental law of nature is that energy energy cannot be created or destroyed. Therefore, I, I say because it cannot be created or destroyed, then it is flowing. I mean, it's not, it's never actually static. And so there is always, there is always, um, there's an effect to any cause of any kind. But the, the good news about that is that you create, if we want to judge it, <laughs> as a negative cause creating a negative effect, we can just have a positive one right after it and, and it smooths everything out and it just becomes a part of, of the energy. It, it's healed, you might say. And that's very empowering. Right. Well, you know, there's that ancient uh, story of, of uh, King Solomon mm. who went to one of his um, oracles <clears throat> and said, find me a ring like, um, turn my sadness into joy find me some type of object that could turn my heavy heart uh, into um, a smile and so the oracle headed out you know was out there for like wandering in the desert who knows where he was wandering comes back a year later and says i i I found it i found a jeweler and he made you a ring and inside the ring uh inscribed in hebrew it said gamze yaavor and this of course translated into english means this too shall pass. Mm. And so, of course, instantly, King Solomon was happy and then suddenly had that bittersweet moment where he suddenly realized, oh, (laughs) Oh. this this too shall pass. And so we realize, you know, here we are, peaks and valleys flowing through life, and we have an opportunity to just remind ourselves when we find ourselves attached to a particular high or low that... uh, Gamze ya avor, this too shall pass. Mm. And so we have we have that ability inside of us to embrace the fact that uh, of the impermanence of of every moment, and that means that we sort of have an obligation, a responsibility mm-hmm. to well, let me bring my best to this moment. Yes. Let me let me show up and forgive myself when I wasn't my best, but let me let that be a reminder to to reach a little harder the next time. And that way we can have a little more self-forgiveness, have a little more self-kindness, have a little more um, self-compassion, and then have a little more self-love because it's impossible to flow those out into the world unless it starts in our own heart Mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Again, that, that golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You must do unto yourself in the same way that you would other. There's, that's just the truth under the principle of one. There's also the divine principle of awareness that you talk about in sacred powers and in the, in sacred powers, you say every moment in our existence begins with awareness. If we are not aware of something, it doesn't exist in our consciousness. Wow. Isn't that powerful? That, that is evidence of our creator essence. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's really funny because, um, I just, uh, just watching, uh, the handmaid's tale. Uh, Yes. There's a, um, we have to ask ourselves sort of, kind of, um, if I don't see it, whether it's happening or not, it's not in my consciousness. So if I don't see it, if I don't hear it, 
if there's a whole bunch of things that if I'm not really manifesting them into the real world, they don't actually exist in my consciousness. Mm. And so that's one of the most beautiful aspects. Turn it the other way. If I do say it, it does exist. If I do think it, it becomes real. If I do point at it, it suddenly is as real as it can get. And so where do we want our attention to be? Do we want it to be on healing? Do we want it to be on love? Or do we want it to be on ruminating and getting angry and working out um, you know, plans to you know, get revenge on someone? Really, is that, where, is that where your attention is going to be? And so you, know, you can view it, you know, it's just shining the light. It's not a question of good or bad. You know, these, a lot of these teachings, um, they're not about judgment. They're not about good or bad or positive or negative. They're just shining the light. And so everything begins with awareness. Mm. And if you're not aware, then it's just moving right past you. And if suddenly it is, you know, you are aware of it, then you can create it into whatever you want. The Buddha said, um, all that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we create the world. And so this is like a, a, a fairly important aspect to our lives. If we think about it, um, what do you want to manifest? You want to manifest love? Put your attention on love. You want to manifest uh, fear? Then, then rock on and put your attention on fear. And suddenly we realize in any single moment, I can create my own reality. And I can have a life that's just filled with love and filled with kindness and filled with joy and filled with celebration and filled with acknowledgement for the divine. Or I can have a life or, I, or, or, or choose a moment where I'm feeling less than and I'm not feeling sacred and I don't acknowledge that there's something bigger than me. You get to pick. And, and it's, it's always a choice. You know, and there are people who, when they are feeling non-sacred as you were saying, and maybe they're in pain and they're in recognition of all that is going wrong, you know, whether they are witnessing what's going on in politics or how there is social injustice and um, inequity between our brothers and sisters. And they, you know, so basically someone who's feeling in that place of skepticism, this, I think this part of the teaching can be more challenging when you're in that place, because they, it feels to the, someone in that awareness of that kind of suffering that we're saying, take no action and ignore, spiritually bypass, you know what I mean? Spiritually bypass the things that are going wrong in the world and take no action and disregard those who need our support and our help and our saving even. How, how, do, we, how do we help to build that bridge for someone who instantly, you know, I can feel that, I can feel someone listening and saying, oh yeah, whatever, you two just want to be as spouting these spiritual platitudes. And I, of course, we all have friends who are in that awareness. What do you say? How do you expand upon that a little bit? You know, I feel very, very strongly um, uh, about this aspect mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I've had lots of conversations about this and I've in, been interviewed and I've written a lot about this. Um, but the, the, the line from, uh, from The Handmaid's Tale, which I'm, I've, just finished season two of The Handmaid's Tale. And there's such, there's so many beautiful lines. But as, um, as she gives birth to her baby, she says, by telling you this story, I will your existence. I tell, therefore you are. And so that's about suddenly creating, you know, the, the manifestation of something. It's right, it's right up there with, with, with Buddha's quote about um, uh, all that arises uh, with our thoughts. Yes. So here we are on this, on this beautiful planet, 7.6 billion people. It's been going on for 13 billion years, if not before. Um, we are stardust, rippling stardust. Everything we are made up of was born at the heart of a star. So there's nothing that separates us. And so the person who's suffering in Myanmar right now, um, being slaughtered by the genocide of his government, you know, that's 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 ripping apart at both of us as well. There is no suffering outside of us that's not that that's not being felt at the personal level. Nothing is happening universally that's not being felt at the personal level. We are create we co-created every single thing we don't like on the planet, every single thing that co that is darkness on the planet, every injustice on the planet. We are co-creation of yes. whether you want to acknowledge that or not. We can do that. 
but but here's the challenge that that I would that I would have. I believe that we need to always think globally, but we need to act locally. Mm-hmm. That might be getting on a plane, landing in Myanmar, and then giving away things, or or helping people, or comforting people, or or or, or protesting. So. I'm not judging what you should do with that. Some of us are activists and some of us are pacifists, yes. but everyone has the ability to act in some way. So Lao Tzu 5,000 years ago said, if there's to be peace you know, in the world, there needs to be peace in the nations. If there's to be peace in the nations, there needs to be peace in the cities. If there's to be peace in the cities, there needs to be peace in the villages. If there's to be peace in the villages, there needs to be peace in the home. And if there's to be peace in the home, there needs to be peace in the heart. So I'm not saying don't care about the nations, don't care about man-made borders and things beyond them. But we need to set it here in our own hearts. And so um, this is about, I don't know, um, several years ago after the uh, nuclear facility in uh, Fukushima. Uh, the tsunami came and destabilized it and, and radioactive waters flowing through the area and people, you know, tons of people, you know, thousands and thousands of people losing their homes and, uh, and being threatened by radioactive waters. And I'm with a friend of mine and I pop over to his house. We're about to drive up to LA and so we're hanging out and uh, I said, come on, let's, let's hop in the car and, and let's go up to LA. And he goes, well, just a minute. I, I want to make a donation to, uh, to Fukushima. I'm on the Red Cross site right now. And I want to do that. And his son, who's uh, about two years old, had a pot upside down with a wooden uh, mixing spoon. And he was banging on the pot. Bam, 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 bam. So that was going on in the background. And he has two twin girls. They were about six at the time. And they were giggling and running around the dining room. Shrieking. And my wife was saying to him, well, listen, if you guys are going up to L.A., maybe you could pick up, um, there's, a, there's a furniture store up there, and uh, there are these two ottoman chairs that I've been looking at online, and maybe you could pick those up. Meanwhile, he's entering his name, he's entering his address, he's typing in all his credit card information into the site, and he hits send, and the page goes blank, and it says, oops, sorry, something went wrong, please enter all your information again. And his two-year-old son's banging on the pot, and his girls are giggling and running around the the um, dining room table and his wife is saying, you know, Hey, um, maybe you could pop up into West Hollywood. There's a, a friend of mine has a restoring place up there and he was working on like this kitchen cabinet and maybe you could bring home those. And I could look at those because I, I wanted to reface our kitchen cabinets. And that kid is banging on the, on the <laughs> pot and he types all the information all over again, enters the credit card information, expiration date, secret code on the back of it. Hit send. Boom. Page goes blank. It's the, sorry, we didn't capture any of your information. Please enter it all again. And he was, he was putting in a $5,000. He was, he was, he was putting in a fairly large amount um, as a, you know, a quick online don- donation. So he's getting a little exasperated. The kid's banging on the pot. The kids are, the two <laughs> girls are running around the table and his wife says, oh, you know what? You don't have to do that. But uh, I have a cousin in Venice up there. Maybe you could go to her, her house. And uh, she's got this beautiful lamp that I was wondering in, and there's like a crescendo, like everyone's talking at once. And he types all this stuff in, hits send, everything goes blank again. And he's sort of, you could see him starting to melt down. And he goes, will everyone please shut up? I'm trying to make a donation to Fukushima. And like, that was my moment. That was, that was it. That was like, does it really even matter? Like those kids are going to be traumatized forever. They're going to be like thinking their father was like screaming at the top of his lungs. And... So all I'm saying is, yeah, we need to think globally. Some things we can't actually fix, but probably if he had just woken up, since he never was able to send the money to Fukushima, since it didn't work after he did it three times, if he had woken up and maybe cuddled his son and maybe you know squeezed his kids and maybe hugged his wife, and like who knows the power of that ripple. Yeah. And so we need, if you're acting kind to someone else and you're not practicing self-kindness it's an act you're acting and you can pull that off for a while but it's fake you know you're you know if you're if you're sending compassion but you're not self 
for forgiving and self-compassionate, then it's a pose and it's made up. And so we have an opportunity to get more authentically loving of ourselves, forgive ourselves, something that we're holding a grudge against ourselves about, and then flow our new evolved persona back into the world, we could probably accomplish so much more as kinder, more generous, nicer individuals on ourself. And then maybe we do make a greater impact mm. in another place. So I'm not saying don't think about those things. I'm saying always think about those things. Right. Where do we get to act? Right here, locally. It doesn't get more local than your heart. Yes. Oh my goodness. It doesn't get more local than your heart. Have you ever said that before? <laughs> no, but I'm say it right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I just have to remind you, you just said that. So you can <laughs> quote yourself later. <laughs> <laughs> Act locally. It doesn't get more local than your heart. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> well, another one of the divine principles, I mean, excuse me, one of the sacred powers is the divine principle of rebirth. And you say, with every breath, I am reborn. That's what I actually experienced this morning as I started the show. And I said, I had this moment where I just felt the affirmation. I lived the choice of joy. That's amazing. And that is something that we can, yeah, we can, we can experience healing. We can experience the world being in, in balance and justice within by, cho by choosing, like you say, forgive yourself. Well, then that, that is the place to start to be able to feel social justice, have some social justice within yourself. In this moment, you can be reborn. Right. Yes. You know, it's, we are constantly evolving. We would be denying the most magnificent aspect of ourself if we denied our rebirth, mm -hmm. if we denied that our ability to shed the skin that was once constricting us. And that could have been five minutes ago mm -hmm. to shed that skin. And then, you know, animals do it. You know, they, they, they molt, they mm -hmm. shed, uh, you know, whether it's a dog or a snake or, or, or a wolf, you know, or a bear. You know, they are just they are letting go of the previously constricted aspect of their being. And so we have that, you know, there's a great, great quote, when I let go of who I am, I become who I might be. Mm -hmm. That takes courage, takes a boldness. But if we can give ourselves permission to like, let me not hold on to this definition of who I was up until this moment. And let me be the the kinder, more generous, more courageous version of myself. What does that even mean? So, you know, I stress there, this is, these have existed for thousands and thousands of years, whether it's baptism by water, baptism mm -hmm. by fire, all the initiations that we've seen. And when you take um, any type of ritual, and add some kind of meaning to it. Like there's lots of rituals, such as making tea. It's not particularly meaningful making our tea every day. But if we can take rituals that we do and add meaning to them, that equals transformation. And that's how we can suddenly shift. So if, we, if I can say to myself, you know what? I've been holding myself back. I've been dimming my light. I've been biting my tongue. I've been walking on eggshells. I've been playing small for so long. And today, this minute, today I... I Allow, let me allow myself to shed some of those constrictions, some of those limiting beliefs, and let me step into my best version. Let me step into my power. Let me own my impact here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a permission thing. You know, I, I talk about a lot about chakras in, in sacred powers. And, you know, our throat chakra, a lot of people um, refer to the throat chakra, the Vishuddha chakra, as the chakra of expression. But it's also the chakra of permission. Yes, and when we can open up our voice, and not just our oral voice, um, but you know our voice, how we move through the world, our persona, and then give ourselves permission to step into the better version of ourselves. And this doesn't mean like a you know a lot of people say, well, aren't I enough? It's like yeah, you're enough, but you're we're all carrying around baggage. We're all holding on to something right now that no longer serves us. How about just giving ourselves permission to just loosen our grip a little bit? On that because maybe it served us five years ago 10 years ago 20 years ago or maybe it served us right up until now but i believe that what got us to this moment may not be the thing that's going to get us to the next moment mm. so why not the tools are internal we don't have to go no equipment necessary we don't actually have to go outside you know as long as we're listening to, to charmed life that's the only tool that we actually need <laughs> right now um, and so we can give ourselves permission to say you know what let me risk, let me take a chance on me mm. right now. 
and see what that you know evolves to, what that unfolds to. And I think that can be uh, a, a powerful launching point for um, promotional freedom oh, and I love it. fulfillment. You know, we are almost out of time. And before we get to the last principle that I would love for you to touch upon for a moment, I want to tell everyone that David G. has so graciously offered a free guided meditation that you can download on his website. You'll find the link in the show notes. And I will, it's davidgmeditationacademy.com slash, and just look for the products, essentially. That would be easy. And there is a coupon code, which is Meditate with David G. So go look in the show notes here, whether you're watching live or um, listening on YouTube or uh, iTunes. Go check it out. There's a, a, a code there for you. And one of his amazing meditations is offered to you. And you know, to give yourself some of that permission. And, and speaking of, as you, you were saying, to be able to allow yourself to step forward and make the change that the the sacred power that we haven't mentioned yet is the divine principle of inner power in which you say the catalyst of light is it is the catalyst of life the inner fire is the source of your passion your clarity your creativity your courage your compassion your forgiveness your purpose your love and your sense of personal power yes and that is that action that you were talking about yeah i think i think we you know, they don't call it the solar plexus for nothing. Right. You know, exactly. Because, it's the sun. Because, it's fire. Because it looks like the sun. So <laughs> we um, we have an opportunity on a fairly consistent basis to recognize, hey, there's this big sun out there. Actually fuels the entire solar system that we're in. Fuels this entire and warms this entire planet that we're on. Um, it is the source uh, for growth of virtually every single entity on the planet, whether it's plant-based or, or, or animal-based. And that same exact aspect rests inside of us. It's our power pack. Mm-hmm. You know, like, why haven't we done the things that we've wanted to do? We were afraid. Yeah. We didn't trust, perhaps. Um, and, and I think that's, you think of all the things, you, when you take your last breath, will you be thinking about things that you, um, did that you regret or all the things that you didn't do that you regret not doing. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? And so, you know, I encourage people right now, and I, and I would like to encourage all of, all of our listeners right now as well to let's create our own agenda. It's really easy. We wake up and we get like 30 emails before we even get out of bed and they tell us what we should think and what we should do and where we should go and how you know what's important to us. And we have an opportunity right now to like write our own agenda, create the the narrative of our life that we would like to have. That's starting inside of us with that spark in our Manipura chakra. That's you know so starting in our own heat source. We, when we can align that fire that's inside of us with that divine fire out there, you know, that is like the pure oneness. That's the most amazing thing on the planet because then we're fully aligned with the universe. Mm. If what I care about is what the universe cares about, it's going to manifest. It's going to get done. If I care about something that's clearly not in the the exact same mindset as the universe, I'm going to have to struggle to make that happen. And maybe it's going to unhappen the second I take my my hands off of that because I'm forcing so so hard we should you know not confuse you know there's a there's a big difference between power which we have and force Mm -hmm. which is always like trying to make something happen that probably isn't in alignment in the moment and so the uh the divine principle of inner fire that's determining our passion that's determining you know essentially how we love who we love what we love what love is to us that determines our uh, why we're here what what are we doing? What's our calling? Yes. You know the ancient the ancient word um, in Sanskrit, um, and it's about twelve thousand years old. It's called dri d h r i dri. We get the word dharma from that root, but dri means means that which upholds. Essentially, it was a force, an ancient force, that held the stars apart, kept pushing them out infinitely, and yet had the ability to hold the universe together. What is that force that can expand infinitely and yet at the same time hold things together? So that was called Dri, Mm. D-H-R-I. So the divine principle of inner fire 
encourages you to access your own dri. Ask yourself that critical question. What holds your stars apart? and your universe together. And based on that, that's the narrative you should have in your life. Those are the actions that you should take. Everything else that's not aligned with that, and I put things through a filter all the time, nourishment or distraction. And if it's a distraction, I let it go. And if it's going to nourish in line with my dri, with what holds my stars apart, my universe together, then I lean hard into that. Mm. I think we can make, you know, much more conscious choices, choices that are more purposeful, choices that are more fulfilling to us if we are, allow ourselves to be led by that, um, by that sacred power. Oh, I love nourishment or distraction. That's powerful. That's good to remember <laughs> if it's supporting your three. Pretty easy, too. <laughs> it's easy, yeah. It's an easy one. Or fear or love is another way, of course, that we, we look at that, the choices or the thoughts that we're having. Well, this has been amazing, and I could s sit at your feet and uh, hold the hem of your ro robe and listen for hours. <laughs> I, of course, I, I'm just joking. But um, this has been really amazing. And again, uh, you know, I am deeply grateful to be able to connect with you. I am, uh, I honor you and the work that you do. It, I'm just such a, I would say, a fan, but it's just really important to me. And I thank you so much for doing that work on our beautiful world. So we are, I, I would love to maybe have you back some other time if you would ever be interested and just so much, so much gratitude to you. And thank you again for coming and thank you for offering the meditation to the audience. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thanks for, for sharing this, uh, this sacred, uh, time. Oh. Um, and, um, yes, I'd love to come back. You know, I love hanging out with you. You're doing <laughs> You're doing such beautiful work, and um, I think you know our hearts are are so aligned. So uh, I'm I'm a fan of yours and a supporter <laughs> of the work that you do, that's and of a charmed life. So um, that's yeah. very generous. Let I me appreciate. Know. It. Absolutely, I appreciate that. And thank you, everyone who who tuned in this week, whether you're watching live or or we're listening in an archive. And I will see you again next episode. Thanks for tuning in. I love you, whoever you are. Mm -hmm.